Hare Om Namaha. Quote, Now to take such guidance means the spiritual master should also be a very perfect man. Otherwise, how can he guide? That was from a platform lecture by Prabhupada on March 6, 1966 in New York. And then we come to another platform lecture on August 10th, 1974 in India. Quote, The Guru must be Mahatma and Muni. Muni means thoughtful, philosopher. Not foolish rascal manufacturing some philosophy. And Mahatma Pihi, not only self-realized, but by his character, by his behavior, by his understanding, he must be a Mahatma. He must be Mahatma, real Mahatma. We want guru like that, unquote. Like all metaphysical societies, the cult of Bhutti Yoga is richly symbolic. It contains its own prerogatives. In ascending to a cult, metaphysical, and or spiritual perfection, and spiritual perfection is called Siddha, S-I-D-D-H-A, there is an ultimate summit. It is very rarely attained, but it is attainable. There are essential mileposts that must be secured along the way. In other words, along with those subsidiary attainments, Guidance must be sought and followed in order to attain any higher octave on the transcendental scale, what to speak of the final note of the last octave. If you want to make spiritual progress, that guidance must be spiritual. If you want to make metaphysical progress on the mesoteric level, your guide or master must have a fund of metaphysical knowledge and accompanying realization. In all such special endeavors, there can be no doubt that the journey consists of a great deal of hidden or occult principles, laws, and truths. All of these will be connected to their corresponding spiritual and metaphysical powers or principalities. Spiritual enlightenment, Siddha, is in and of itself one, yet at the same time it is secured in stages and advanced from there in stages. There is no contradiction in this truth. The Guru Parampara is the best path to enlightenment in this age of quarrel and hypocrisy which is known as Kali Yuga. And the Guru Parampara of Bhutti Yoga is the least difficult means in order to transcend the vicissitudes of this age and attain enlightenment, crossing over the ocean of nescience. The Guru is a member of that exclusive group. He's crossed over. The best of all Gurus, the extremely advanced spiritual master, has attained Source, capital S. He associates constantly with Source, and is at the ultimate summit of liberation. Manu Shana Sahasre Shu Kashchid Yatati Siddhai Yatatam Apisidhana Kashchin Mang Vaiti Tatvataha. Quote Out of many thousands of men, one endeavors for perfection. Indeed, out of those so endeavoring, of those who have actually achieved perfection, only one knows me in truth, unquote, me being capitalized. From one perspective, the guru has a monopoly on truth, capital T. But he never says anything like that or makes any such claim. The spiritual master at any level takes on only disciples who are sincere and serious, although in very special cases, there can be exceptions to this. Such disciples, even before initiation, must approach the guru with basic knowledge in spiritual life. And they must be lucky 
beyond the material or even mesoteric meaning and application of the word lucky. When a qualified occultist approaches a qualified master, the same holds true. When a seeker approaches a qualified Vaishnava guru, that guru desires to turn that disciple into a perfect man. Disciple means discipline. Only a dedicated disciple can qualify for becoming perfect. Organized religions are entirely different. They consist of leaders and followers who believe that perfection cannot be achieved during life. As such, they do not approve of cults which endeavor for perfection because everyone in organized religions is ineligible for that. Those who are ineligible take to pseudo or quasi-occult or religious faiths which rationalize and pervert the process under the banner of no man can become perfect. This is the predominant faithlessness of the West, of course, but it has seeped into the East at this time. Every cult utilizes markings and symbols exclusive to it. Here and there, a bit of synchronicity may be spotted, but that is always very limited, because it must be so. In relation to the various paths of either a cult or spiritual realization, there will be some synchronicity to the degree that the founder was actually on one, which led, if fully prosecuted, to mystic attainments and or mukti. As will soon be discussed, the mileposts leading to mukti or liberation compared between the Dvaita and Advaita lines have corresponding stages, but they're of different names. Yet at a certain point, that synchronicity also is non-existent as it must be. In relation to the mesoteric process, the synchronicity ends even before the causal plane is attained what to speak of the initial plane of perfection. Symbolo symbology certainly has its place in spiritual life, but the real deity, capital D, should never be considered a mere symbol or a mere image or reflection of the absolute truth, the summon bonum. There are many cults, both Eastern and Western, which claim a line of disciplic succession, culture and heritage dating back to ancient times. When the claim is legitimate, that line needs to be unbroken. A few of these claims are bona fide, both in relation to mystic power, metaphysical, spiritual, and or devotional manifestations. Bizarre rites are not a mandate nor a prerequisite in order to establish any such claim. Now we all know secret societies exist, but they are not as resistant to destruction as our organized religions. And this certainly applies to the case of the cults. As they are opposed by every organized religion to greater or lesser degrees. Secrecy is embedded in the realization. It is not mandatory in the beginning, although transmission of confidential knowledge demands eligibility. Idante nata paskaya na hoktaya kadachana na cha shu shu shave vachyang na chamang yo apiyasyati. Quote, this confidential knowledge is not to be spoken by you at any time to anyone who is not austere, to one who is not devoted or engaged in devotion, or to one who is also envious, unquote. Eligibility is known in the Sanskrit language as utikar. To receive to accept as it is, not warping it, and to assimilate confidential knowledge requires adhikara in any line, any specific line. 
the properly initiated disciple can become perfect only in that way, in that connection, because the bona fide guru accelerates the eligibility of his disciple as integral to the process. Otherwise, prematurely giving knowledge to anyone without the requisite udhikar will produce only counterproductive results. The knowledge will be unintelligible. Such a transmission will also tend to be misconstrued and misinterpreted for misguided purposes. These evil consequences are to be avoided and therefore the acharya is required. Acharya van purusho veda. Quote, one who has a bona fide acharya knows what is what. Unquote. A bona fide guru is known as a spiritual master or an acharya. Knowledge in either metaphysical or spiritual life is called jnana. The disciple accepts and performs authorized service, seva, to and for the guru in a submissive attitude and with great respect. Thereafter, in due course of time, that knowledge, jnana, matures into vijnana, wisdom. It becomes more valuable at that time as it has the power to lead to enlightenment. In most cases, the root of any exoteric society or civilization is actually esoteric. In some cases, that esoteric influence can be traced. In some cases, it is still even extant. In other cases, it cannot be traced out and or it has been scattered and destroyed by mundane or ordinary upheavals. In all cases, the individual involved in a secret society and or connected to a line of teaching and process is seeking some kind of perfection. Those seeking mystic powers are not necessarily seeking the highest perfection, yet mystic powers themselves are known as siddhis. They are also called miraculous powers. Nevertheless, whether they can actually deliver it or not, the majority of these cults are supposed to afford the opportunity to the disciple to become liberated from samsara, the cycle of birth and death. This means transcending all the layers of conditioning. These layers exist in the universe and within the individual, as within, so without. They work against perfection when they are engaged for material objectives, which is why they exist. And that is their natural tendency, what they are designed to do, to work for material objectives, which are binding. The layers on the outermost plane are the visible growth sheath or body known as the Anamaya Kosha. Within that, there is the invisible, yet still considered gross, sheath, and it is known as the Pranamaya Kosha. The astral body is known as the Manamaya Kosha, and the causal body within it is connected to the Mahatattva, also known as contaminated consciousness. In other words, Siddha is not attained until these coverings are transcended completely, which is rarely achieved, especially in this age. Yet it can be achieved, and that perfectibility of attainment is what any transcendental organization is supposed to be all about. Mundane energy and its modes almost always works to engage the conditioned spirit soul in the above-mentioned sheaths or coverings. Engagement in their identification is counterproductive to achieving perfection, obviously. In point of fact, although the Mahatattva is the source of all the downline conditioning, meaning astral and physical, the Mahatattva or causal plane is hardly ever experienced in mundane civilization and most people don't even know about it. Nevertheless, 
There can be hints transmitted about all of this, even in material energy, and these sometimes become popularized. When such is the case, they often serve as analogies. One metaphysical cult or way, and it is certainly interested in miraculous powers, calls these B influences in its in-house code. In other words, the majority of people are absorbed and enamored by mundane influences, and in that cult, these are called A influences. A influences guarantee samsara. Perfection can never be achieved for an individual absorbed in A influences. Entirely transcendental transmissions are known as C influences according to this code. However, influences which are transcendental cannot purely be actuated in mundane civilization because it will invariably warp them when thrown into its ordinary mix. Even in their warp state, however, they can give a glimmer about the actual situation of conditioned life, then they can serve as analogies. Analogies are never perfect. And that is the reason their transmission of partial and to some degree perverted knowledge is only analogous. They can be stepping stones in the very beginning, which help to lead to perfection, as they can lead to initial contact with sea influences. And that contact then can facilitate recognition of these being sea influences and C influences are required for anything to be effective in transcending material nature. Now, once such analogy was transmitted through a popular television series in the late 80s and early 90s called Quantum Leap, many of its fundamentals, premises, and plots are nonsense and do not constitu constitute B influences whatsoever. We shall briefly discuss a few of these first, then move on to the ones which do constitute influence B. You cannot travel back in time or bounce around in a physical body within a range of time like between the early 50s and the late 70s or early 80s as per the quantum leap. Atoms can do no such thing. The atoms of material bodies in the past have all been incorporated into other bodies, both animate and inanimate. That atoms, atoms, A-T-O-M-S, can engage in time travel and reassemble is at the core of that fictional series, but it's misleading and does not qualify as a B influence. The second premise is that quantum physicists will in the future invent a spectacular machine to transport an individual to the past through the future. It is also illusory. A third premise is illusory as depicted in the series, although when understood and applied properly, it does constitute a B influence. And this is the idea that the future can be changed. Jumping now, pun intended, to a movie different from Quantum Leap, Changing the future in terms of scheduled samsara is indicated by analogies made in the movie Groundhog Day. They're very flawed, however, because the whole gist of the film was meant to promote what's called eternal recurrence, which is anti-Vedic. Reincarnation is the Vedic teaching, although one Buddhist line apparently still promotes the idea of recurrence. The analogy was only partially applicable in that film, however, and that a conditioned soul in his or her present life can individually change his or her own future by upgrading mundane destiny or transcending it via engagement in non-karmic words and action. In this case, the future does get changed, but mostly on an individual basis and or in the context of overcoming samsara which is certainly not transcended in that comedy. Ah, jumping back to the Quantum Leap series, the chief character is Sam Beckett, 
who is a child prodigy in science. According to the script, he invents a kind of time machine and under pressure of losing his government funding for the project, selects himself prematurely as the guinea pig for testing it. And in the first episode, he's transported back to 1953. And that was the first episode of five seasons of multiple episodes. It was a very successful series. He takes the identity in that first episode of an Air Force pilot testing supersonic speeds. He then jumps to other identities within basically a 30-year range, one after another, when any mission in any given identity is fulfilled. The analogy here is quite obvious. The conditioned soul transmigrates from one completely separate material identity to another in samsara. He is almost always not born in the same year from which he has transmigrated. There are subordinate analogies because Sam has no idea where he is or his mission after he skips to another environment and another identity. This is analogous to the ignorance of a newborn baby. It also indicates that everyone enters into the world in a new identity that is far from perfection. Indeed, in that identity in the beginning years, he or she does not even conceive of the idea of perfection. This is a B influence analogous to samsara, wherein the conditioned soul is transported to a new identity, a new family, and a new, but often sometimes renewed, svabhava, or state of being. He or she receives a renewed set of desires, and these desires are connected to this different environment in time and space. This analogy is an excellent one, and it constitutes in part, subconscious for most of the viewers, of course, the reason for the series becoming as popular as it did. Another B influence in the series is the personality of Al Kalavici. He represents the guru. He is called, quote unquote, the observer in the series, but he is much more than that. He interacts directly with Sam as a holographic image and person. As an analogy, it holds up, but not as a potential reality. The argument could be made that Al is not the guru, but the Paramatma within. There is a specific reason why this is not a viable conclusion, and that is because Paramatma is represented by Ziggy, a small handheld computer who or which determines past and future probabilities indicating what, what must be done in this particular mission. All of this has just been discussed only for the purpose of understanding the path to perfection, the perfectibility of man. You must recognize what is helpful and you must, just as importantly, recognize what is entirely unhelpful. Now it's time to segue out of these analogies. Let us instead discuss another stumbling block on the path to perfection, and that is surrendering yourself to institutional influence as the means to allegedly attain siddha. It is a very misguided means. In discussing this one, we shall not do so in a generic fashion, however. We shall instead elucidate it in the context of one specific cult, the movement known in general as Krishna consciousness. This movement came to the West in the mid-60s, and it remained pure and potent for a little over a decade. It provided everything needed for an individual initiated into it to attain perfection in this life. It also provided a shelter from the degrading influences of Western civilization. All of this broke down rather quickly, however, under the influence of time. Proclaiming a governing body to be the ultimate spiritual authority amounts to nothing more than an institutional imposition of gurus and initiations represented by and conducted by party men 
who take advantage of such a construct. Even though it may be named as an occult society, it is an organized religion in essence. This was never wanted, designed, or ordered by the founder of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, but it came to pass when the real process was scattered after he departed physical manifestation in the late 70s. He formulated and formed a governing body known as the GBC, which was meant to advise his temple presidents in their designated management of the various centers throughout the civilized world, which he guided directly in the initial years. That initial process was very perfect, but it could not be continued once the movement expanded dramatically at the beginning of the 70s. It even went to Africa. As such, Prabhupada, the founder, created an advisory board which was directly in touch with him. In the beginning, it was constituted of 12 disciples and it expanded throughout the founder's remaining years on earth. In the first year, it functioned well. After that, it became an authority unto itself. It insidiously converted into an absolute power, which was never its mission. Just after the founder departed physical manifestation, 11 of its most powerful members hijacked his bhakti cult. This should not be misinterpreted to mean that the governing body merged into oblivion due to massive deviation. From the occult standpoint, it became a dormant egregor, waiting for the right time, utilizing those aggressive and ambitious men for its own purpose, which had become detached from and indeed inimical to the orders of the founder. Tatvamasi. The centerpiece guide was worshipped in this cult of Buddha Yoga, and that founder, that centerpiece, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, was the one who brought the message and the movement to the West. At that time, it was up to the Vedic and Vaishnav standard, which focuses on Guru, Shastra, and Sadhu. An institution and its governing body is not integral to that triad. As such, a governing body is only meant to serve devotees in their quests for siddha, serve the devotees, not overwhelm them or overrule them. The gurus act as direct conduits to siddha. The shastra or revealed texts act as a direct conduit to siddha, as do the sadhus and holy men they are also direct conduits. At most, any kind of governing body, along with the institution it controls, is a marginal influence. In essence, it is really no conduit at all. It simply keeps everything managed well so that the action principle of the occult process can be effective and promoting self-realization and God-realization for the practitioners who act on and in the process. The Krishna Consciousness Movement is its teachings, its followers, who are mostly in the mode of goodness, and its founder. The manifestation of that substance is the action of the devoted men and women who are linked to all of these. Genuine occultists are the personal embodiment of the substance of the movement, in this case of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, which was incorporated in mundane society as ISKCON. The centers, buildings, and the governing body are either advisory or passive entities. They are not unimportant, but they are not nearly as important as the active principle Prabhupada called the principle of the active devotees as, quote, the real workers, unquote. The corporate forms affording the institution to better function in the whole civilization is also a passive form. It is not the substance. It's helpful. It's helpful unless it's misused. 
It's helpful in the matter of providing facilities for actuating the substance. The governing body consists of devotees, so that is an apparent contradiction, but it's easily resolved. Individually, they're all meant to strive for and attain siddha. However, as a collective body representing the institution, the Governing Body Commission, or GBC, is integrated into the form, not the active principle. It is meant to see that the form works well, and that is why it was not within the power of the GBC to do, do what it did in the late 70s. When the Governing Body superimposes its so-called absolute power instead of its actual advisory power, over the active principles, the real workers in the Krishna movement. Then that governing body acts beyond its adhikar. It acts in deviation as to its actual authorization. It is no longer authorized by doing so, but it pretends to be. All of its spiritual authority has been essentially lost, taken away having been converted into institutional power. This is what went down in the Krishna Consciousness Movement in the late 70s. It was already happening even before Prabhupada left the scene in November of 1977. Passive institutionalism took over, compressing and suppressing the active principle, the individual devotees. It subverted the process. It created a metaphysical roof in which all underneath could not get above it. Siddha was no longer possible there, and it was not discussed, and was thus forgotten or misunderstood in that cult under the roof, under the roof of the party men, under the roof of the deviated, vitiated GBC. The 11 great pretenders were tagged as zonal acharyas, a complete concoction. On the strength of institutionalism, they all feigned to have attained siddha. This pretension degraded the concept of siddha. The process was inexorably changed. The zonal imposition only lasted about eight years its so-called acharyas then were exposed and jacked down or excommunicated, but very major and lasting damage was done during their epoch. All 11 of the zonal acharyas were dependent upon the governing body for their opportunities to imitate the liberated founder acharya. As such, the astral governing body, the egregor, inimical to the movement and to anyone in it seeking siddha, got over. It got over after the zonal acharya scheme crashed and burned. When it cratered, only the governing body remained. In the guise of the savior, it never was and never could be. At that time, in the mid-80s, the form dominated the active principle completely. Institutional gurus mostly produced institutional disciples and the party men of so-called ISKCON thrived. It was a deplorable situation. Decadence, along with putrefaction, entered that deviated movement in a big way, especially on the fringes around various centers feeding it. This is not to be misinterpreted to mean that the zonal acharyas did not also create improperly initiated disciples. They most certainly did. Still, during that epoch, the active principle was more prominent than the passivity of the institutional format, despite the fact that its active perverted manifestation of the Vedic and Vaishnava scriptures governing gurus and disciples was abominable. As was stated at the very beginning of this audio podcast, 
the guru must be a very perfect man. To become that very perfect man, in seeking to become a siddha, you will encounter, both gross and subtle, significant and powerful obstacles. Everything, even the most mundane of things, is connected to occult principles. Joe Schmo, watching sports on his couch, drinking a six-pack, is surrounded by many negative occult principalities affecting him. Institutionalization of the governing body, especially in the form of considering it wrongly to be the ultimate spiritual authority, creates a kind of fraternity which is locked into its own agenda, one which favors its own men, and all of them are pseudo-spiritual frat boys. It creates a monopoly that has no basis. It acts on occult planes as an impediment to anyone seeking perfection within the wheelhouse of its influence. That applies to those who are now in so-called ISKCON, which is loaded with fake madhyams, as opposed to pretender Mahabharavats in the late 70s and the first half of the 80s. Abuses by the members of this fraternity will be covered over. Those abuses will only be apparently resolved, in most cases. The exception to this damage control will be when the bad fat boy in the commission of overts that are against the law of the host culture also makes the big mistake of criticizing the governing body. Oh, then it will act with vengeance and will scapegoat and excommunicate him with vitriol. When people in the cult realize this, they often leave. This means that bewildered newcomers along with the institutional dyed-in-the-wool cult fanatics, dominate, ever increasingly dominate, the membership of this religion. The governing, problem, the governing body has no problem whatsoever with that, obviously. Attraction to the form over the active principle in so-called ISKCON is non-different from feminizing the cult. The men in there, with but few exceptions, are becoming more effeminate. This makes them more pliable to institutional abuse. But that kind of pliability was not nearly as effective during the heyday of the heady zonal Acharya era. That era was very masculine. It is only because of the major scandals by some of those great pretenders, along with vicious infighting between and amongst them, that the governing body, beginning with damage control, was able to eventually override their reign of psychic terror, and that reign did include murders. That zonal era was the first transformation of the movement. The collegiate compromise replacing it was the second transformation. It was cent per cent based upon the Governing Body Commission being the successor to Prabhupada, an outrageous concoction that could not stand. However, it indicated that so-called ISKCON no longer had confidence in its own men becoming perfect. Those 11 pretender Mahabhagavats were anything but perfect. They were all Sahajas. Yet, achieving Siddha was still supposed to be part of the equation during those heady years of the zonal era. As such, so-called ISKCON, in the second half of the 80s, through its governing body, replaced the masculine principle embedded in that first transformation with the feminine principle of the governing body, being the so-called successor to the founder in the Guru Parampara. The zonals were negative but active actors, perverted reflections of the action principle. That epic was action over form, but it should also be noted that they were all appointed by the governing body to both their posts and their zones. They were all commissioners themselves, of course, but they were still 
dependent upon GBC imprimatur. This indisputable fact is what led to the eventual replacement of one deviation with another. As pointed out last month in our podcast, the second transformation was primarily bogus because it failed to go far enough to reverse the deviation root and branch. It simply replaced some branches and the overall scheme with a collegiate compromise which was rooted in form and femininity. The indisputable leader of the second transformation was Ravindra, Ravindra Swaroop. He got the ball rolling in September of 1984 with the first of his many position papers. Once the new epoch had finally busted the gurus down in 1987 to so-called Mudjim status, please note, none of them were Mudjims, they were all still Sahajas. Here's what Ravindra had to say about the revised movement his collegiate compromise introduced. Quote, By thus establishing the GBC and leaving it as his chosen successor at the head of ISKCON, Srila Prabhupada ensured that the order of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati Thakur would continue to work efficaciously in the world and bear fruit, unquote. Now, during the internet emergence, not long after the late 80s, when anyone typed in ISKCON to the Google search engine, it pulled up its Wikipedia hyperlink. In that Wikipedia thumbnail sketch of what it was, on the right-hand side of the page, after the entry successor, it listed the Governing Body Commission as being the successor the next in the line. The institutional delusion that appears to be Prabhupada's Hare Krishna movement, read so-called ISKCON, did not devolve to its current bad state overnight. It has always been a work and degenerative process, while the real movement of the 60s and the 70s is dead, choked off by that weed known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation. It is a Sahaja movement, an Appa Sampradaya, and it has no shortage of enablers who gloss over all of its many deviations. They do not hold its leaders to task. They are not interested in the real thing. They like the current perverted reflection. They deplore what is revealed here, despite it being based upon Shastra, knowledge, and reason. What is being revealed here is exposing the spiritual invalidity of the current institutional religion, which disguises itself as Prabhupada's Hare Krishna movement. Air quotes ISKCON leaders have a different view about what constitutes their legacy. They have presuppositions about its validity. They have rationalizations about its state of being, its justification, and its so-called history. They present a self-serving so-called history loaded with misinterpretation and malinterpretation. Their corporate power, which is its control over the means of production, and the fulfillment of their ambitions suffice for them and their followers as conclusive proof of the validity of their make show. Since they have gotten away with that for so many compromises over the past 40 plus years, within their circles, confidence is high that they will continue to be able to pull it all off to ultimate victory. The majority of those affiliated with this organized religion includes everyone who strongly believes in and is connected to its form, not just its most egregious players. Nevertheless, all of them certainly share one thing in common. They are not trying to become Siddha. All of these people couldn't care less whether or not their philosophical theories or, if you prefer, justifications are coherent and free from contradiction. Please note, this is never the attitude of a transcendentalist trying for perfection. 
as long as the air quotes ISKCON philosophical system and its processes are approved by the vitiated governing body commission. Whatever is transpiring must be right in their eyes. They care not about disagreements from outer sectors. Everyone with a di different take from theirs is wrong, offensive, and a no-count fringy. Unless he or she is making some significant donations every now and then, read the Western Hindus. If you are able to assimilate and act upon the knowledge you are receiving here, it will have a positive effect on you. The hardcore leaders, party men, fanatics, and similarly dedicated followers of so-called ISKCON have no need within their echo chamber to defend or apologize for anything that their cult represents or has historically twisted into so-called reality. On the scale of its global influence, so-called ISKCON is very small. For some time on Wikipedia, in its description of itself, the GBC, with considerable hubris, stated that it exercises the power to appoint initiating gurus. Not that long ago on Wikipedia, as previously mentioned, it also claimed that the GBC was the successor and disciplic succession to his divine grace. That declaration was taken down when challenged by some of its own party men. It was that egregiously against the standard law of disciplic succession, against the standard law of Guru Parampara. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. In the spring of 1978, when the first transformation took off, it let loose Pandora's box. The principle of Siddha was not entirely forgotten at first, but it was considerably warped in practice. The so-called successors, the 11 great pretenders, were wrongly considered to each be acting in their Siddha Deha. That was utterly ridiculous, as Prabhupada never gave any indication of it. In Bombay, in April of 1977, he verified to a query from his personal servant that no one was qualified to be guru in his movement. But yet at the same time, he called it in Bombay at that time, quote, a little thing, unquote. Attaining Siddha is never a little thing. It is a rare, great, and very big thing. Prabhupada was not referring to Uttama Gurus at that time in Bombay in the early spring of 1977. He was referring instead to regular Gurus, Madhim Udhikaris, which he verified specifically on May 28th, one month later, from his headquarters in Raman Reti with all of the GBC present. He also then said he would appoint gurus, but he never did. If there were gurus with him in his room at that time in May of 1977, why would he not have recognized them? It is because there weren't any. Instead, he appointed Ripviks, who by definition are not perfect. If a Ripvik is actually a Diksha Guru and qualified to initiate, why would he serve as a Ritvik? He would not. He would initiate his own disciples on a regular basis as a regular Guru. Ritviks are not authorized to do that. This, this is because they are not even Madhyams in most cases, what to speak of devoted transcendentalists, rare individuals who have attained Siddha. There are many obstacles on the path to perfection. Certainly, so-called ISKCON is right at the top of the hierarchy of such cult obstacles. If you are one amongst thousands of humans, if you are one who is seeking Siddha, 
beyond the Mahatattva and Nirvana. Bravo. If so, you should avoid falling victim to so-called ISKCON in any way. That institution and all of the Sahaja groups comprising it and or connected to it as competitors cannot help you in attaining to pure spiritual life and perfection. Think about these things. Sadeva Samyam.